Okay, without further ado, uh, my name is Dan Rodriguez. I'm delighted to be uh, moderating this panel, next panel on improving the presidency, the path forward. Uh, I am uh, Harold Washington Professor of Law at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law, where I had the pleasure to serve as Dean from 2012 to 2018. Uh, uh, I'm not the main event, so I'll, I'll spare you uh, introduction of myself. I'll simply observe, in addition to thanking AALS for putting together this wonderful panel, is mentioned that I had the pleasure and honor to, to participate in the AALS as a member of the executive committee at two different times and had the privilege to serve as the president of AALS a number of, of years ago. Uh, without further ado, I wanna introduce the panel. If, if the panelists uh, uh, received a proper introduction, we'd be here uh, half of the afternoon. So my, my uh, fair warning, my introduction will not do them uh, full uh, justice, uh, but nonetheless, let me uh, mention a few aspects to, to fill out uh, their titles, which are listed in, in the program. And I'll also note that they will speak in the order that they are uh, listed. So Laura Dickinson uh, uh, is a chaired professor. Uh, please permit me to, well, no, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. It may be the hardest uh, chair I've ever had to uh, pronounce, but I'll give it a try. The Oswald Semester Kolkwa Research Professor at George Washington School of Law. She taught previously at Connecticut and, uh, and Arizona State. She is an expert and writes and teaches in a myriad areas that are relevant to this panel, including national security, human rights, and the law of armed conflict. Uh, she has uh, served our government, uh, first as a Supreme Court law clerk to Justices Blackman and Justice Breyer, worked uh, in the State Department, and more recently, 2016 and 17, worked as special counsel for the General Counsel of the Department of Defense. And after that service, received the Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Public Service. So we welcome uh, Professor Dickinson. Uh, Judge Alberto Gonzalez could go by many titles, of course, given his extraordinary service uh, in the legal academy and in public service. He is the Dean and Doyle Rogers Distinguished Professor at the College of Law at Belmont University. He served uh, in government in the state of Texas as Secretary of State, as uh, General Counsel to Governor George W. Bush, and then as a Justice on the Texas Supreme Court. He was Counselor to the President, President Bush, uh, during the George Bush uh, administration, and from 2005 to 2007, served as Attorney General of the United States. He received for government service the CIA's Director Award, and is not the only panel; is one of the two panelists who received the Special Medal uh, for Exceptional Public Service from the Department of Defense. Professor Jeff Rosen, colleague of Professor Dickinson's at uh, at George Washington University College of Law, he serves as President and CEO of the National Constitution Center. It's written a number of, of, of important books, one of our nation's leading legal commentators, as you know, and has also written a number of important books on a range of topics, from privacy to national security and to the Supreme Court, biography of William Howard Taft, book on Lewis Brand, Justice Lewis Brandeis, and a book on the Supreme Court, the personalities and rivalries that defined America, which was also part uh, the source of an important series on PBS. And last but certainly not least, Professor Peter Shane, who's the Jacob Davis and Jacob Davis the second chair in law at the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State University. He has taught at a number of law schools at Iowa, uh, has been the dean at the University of Pittsburgh a School of Law, uh, was on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon where he directed the Institute for the Study of Information Technology and Secrecy. He also uh, served in government as part of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice under President Carter and briefly for President Reagan. Uh, and uh, he has, if I can uh, do a book plug, a forthcoming book from the University of California Press, which will be published next year, uh, whose title is Democracy's Chief Executive, Interpreting the Constitution and Shaping the Future of the Presidency. Uh, please uh, put your questions for the panelists. We'll have time for questions into the chat and I will do my best to moderate them. But without further ado, let me, uh, let me call on Professor uh, Dickinson who will start us off. We'll each speak for uh, about 10 minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, it's so great to be part of this dialogue on how to restore the rule of law in the wake of Trump's presidency, sparked by Bob Bauer and Jack Goldsmith's important book. Uh, the book tackles some key national security issues, but 
the project sweeps uh, quite a bit more broadly and therefore doesn't really home in extensively on the particular challenges in the national security arena. And I'm currently working on an article that aims to fill that gap. And so that's gonna be the focus of my comments right now. Uh, specifically, I'll argue that due to the inherently weakened role of the courts in Congress in the national security domain, two key accountability and oversight mechanisms hold heightened significance, inspectors general and whistleblowers. These mechanisms are not often the subject of scholarly research, but due to the information they provide to Congress and the public, uh, as well as their uh, role in catalyzing accountability and oversight, they are, I would argue, especially important in the national security realm. And this became particularly evident during the Trump administration when Trump himself and senior officials attacked inspectors general and whistleblowers to an arguably unprecedented degree. And I was happy to hear Neil Eggleston uh, touch on the role of inspectors general earlier in the day and Anne O'Connell as well. So my remarks will proceed as follows. First, I will briefly discuss the importance of inspectors general and whistleblowers to protect the rule of law in the national security state. Next, I will highlight some of the Trump administration attacks. And finally, I'll show how these actions exposed significant cracks in existing legal frameworks. And I'll, I'll suggest some reforms while briefly addressing potential con constitutional concerns related to such reform proposals. So first, I would just say the operation of the national security state poses quite distinct challenges for democracy and the rule of law. Um, it's important to note that the term rule of law often is trotted out without really defining it. Uh, and that there are, of course, multiple competing conceptions of the rule of law, for example, uh, ranging from a notion of checks on excessive power by any one branch of government, particularly the executive, through separation of powers frameworks, to protections for individual rights, to ideas about predictability in commercial transactions. Um, and uh, for my part here, I am focusing primarily on the checking of uh, abusive executive power. And I take it as my starting point, uh, the observation, which is shared by many scholars, that threats to the rule of law in the national security domain are especially difficult to address uh, because the president wields uh, relatively uh, greater power in relationship to Congress under the Constitution. Um, and the courts are more reluctant to exercise judicial review. Uh, and even when they do uh, under a variety of doctrines, they are quite deferential to executive branch decision making. And furthermore, the need for secrecy uh, often wins out over transparency, which is, of course, necessary for uh, democratic accountability. So um, this is not unique to the Trump administration. Um, uh, you know, the expanded role of the executive has uh, uh, threatened to destabilize democracy and the rule of law throughout history from the Alien and Sedition Acts to the Red Scare uh, to the various Nixon era abuses to the early 9-11 uh, years. Um, because of the reduced role of the courts and the Congress in this arena, mechanisms of what I would call administrative accountability and oversight housed primarily in the executive branch gain outsized importance. And specifically two related mechanisms which provide this crucial role, inspectors general and whistleblowers. Although some versions of these mechanisms date back to early in our country's history, their current form was largely shaped in the post Nixon era, and they expose abuses within the government by providing pathways for disclosure to Congress and the public. And they're also, as I think Neil importantly noted, executive branch norm enforcers. But these mechanisms depend on measures to protect the independence 
of inspectors general and to discourage retaliation against whistleblowers. Now, turning to the Trump administration attacks, um, again, attacks on the rule of law and the national security domain are not unique to the Trump administration, but in the Trump administration, we arguably saw an unprecedented level of hostility to these two crucial mechanisms. First, Trump fired multiple inspectors general for political reasons in what some commentators have called the massacre of inspectors general, um, probably most notably uh, the intelligence community inspector general Michael Atkinson, after he set in motion a chain of events that led to Trump's first impeachment but also Department of Defense uh, Inspector General Glenn Fine and State Department Inspector General Steve Linick, uh, who was investigating Secretary of State Pompeo for a variety of acts of alleged wrongdoing. Um, these firings do sh drew sharp uh, bipartisan condemnation as attacks on the independence and impartiality of inspectors general. Uh, Trump also often filled inspector general vacancies with political appointees in an acting capacity rather than using career inspector general officials, sometimes um, uh, asking them to wear dual hatted roles, raising conflict of interest concerns. Um, and finally, we saw significant attacks on national security whistleblowers in some cases perpetrated by the president himself. Uh, again, probably the most notable example arose in relationship to the first impeachment when Trump personally tweeted attacks on the veracity and political motives of uh, an intelligence community uh, whistleblower who had raised concerns about Trump pressuring the Ukrainian president to investigate Joe Biden's son. Um, Trump supporters uh, uh, exposed that whistleblower's identity, uh, imperiling his or her safety. There's also been data now that's been collected by the Government Business Council that indicates that Trump administration treatment of whistleblowers exerted a significant chilling effect. So uh, these attacks expose uh, cracks in the existing legal frameworks and uh, highlight the need for reforms. Um, and in some cases, it could be said that Trump crossed the legal line. But in general, it could be also argued that Trump acted within existing law. And the bigger threat was, you know, as we've been talking about today, the threat to longstanding behavioral norms. Um, so in my view, these statutory frameworks uh, require reform to bolster the independence uh, of inspectors general, to facilitate transparency and communication with Congress, and uh, better protect whistleblowers. So with respect to inspectors general, the first issue is removal. Existing law allows removal for any uh, reason, uh, generally. Um, Congress could uh, provide for greater limitations on removal, including for cause removal, probably the most controversial, fixed terms for inspectors general, or even just a, a more robust congressional notification requirement in the event of a termination or a private right of action for inspectors general to contest removal. Second, uh, inspectors general could provide greater limits on appointments. Uh, existing law only provides for certain qualifications criteria. You could add uh, limits on inspectors general serving in an acting capacity. For example, uh, uh, can't you can't draw from political appointees, but rather only from career inspectors general. And uh, O'Connell actually mentioned this proposed reform earlier today. Um, you could have a prohibition on dual hatted roles for inspectors general, or, or you could expand uh, qualifications criteria. And third, uh, with respect to inspectors general, um, Trump's attacks exposed weaknesses in reporting authority uh, to Congress. For example, in the case of the intelligence community inspector general, the statute is a little bit unclear what happens if the DNI and the inspector general disagree about whether a complaint is a matter of urgent concern and therefore uh, may be reported to congressional intelligence committees. Um, that's precisely what happened in the lead up to the first impeachment. So the statute could be revised uh, to clarify that the inspector general does have that authority. 
And then turning to whistleblowers, um, you know, Trump's attacks also exposed gaps in current legislative frameworks, particularly for intelligence community whistleblowers who do not have a right to judicial review uh, for retaliation. Um, uh, that could be provided as could greater protections for anonymity. And frankly, all uh, whistleblowers could benefit from more robust judicial review provisions and greater anonymity uh, protection. Now, uh, there are there would likely be some uh, constitutional debate about some of these proposed reforms, and I see I'm, I'm up against my time limit. I'm happy to discuss that in the in the Q and A. Um, I would just say, in conclusion, that you know I don't see any of these reforms as a, a panacea or, as Jack said earlier, a magic bullet. Uh, but I would argue that inspectors general and whistleblowers are are just a critical and often overlooked component of protecting the rule of law in the national security realm. Thank you, Professor Dickinson. Thank you very much. A reminder uh, to put uh, your question. This is for all the attendees in the chat. Uh, uh, Judge Gonzalez. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Laura. You know, let me begin with my de definition of the rule of law. It, it is, uh, I believe, uh, it is the duty of government officials and lawyers and scholars to protect the rule of law. And by that, I mean our government, uh, our sovereign government officials are limited by the law and equally accountable under the law. Now, some believe that uh, during his four years in office, President Trump routinely ignored both professional and personal norms and traditions. His actions were not just inconsistent with the rule of law, but were a direct assault. And the reasons most often given for what occurred during the last administration vary, but the most often cited were that this was a man with a personality disorder who believed he could do what he wanted for his personal benefit, and that he was enabled by staff and members of his own party in Congress who failed to protect the prerogatives of the legislative branch. Specifically, the Republican leadership and rank and file members often appeared to ignore or excuse the president's behavior so long as it did not threaten their political future nor jeopardize their policy objectives. So the deference shown to President Trump was at times disappointing and quite frankly to me, at least shocking. I support several of the recommendations by Bauer and Goldsmith. However, I caution their limits to how much can be addressed in law. To quote Goldsmith uh, when speaking uh, in a conversation reported at NYU Law News, quote, there's a point at which reforms run out in my judgment, the dignity of the office and so much of whether these reforms will be successful and whether the the prestige of the presidency and the dignity of the presidency will be respected is not going to depend on legal reform. It's going to depend on the identity of the person who's the president. So not everything can be done by law. Some things need to be done by elections and the personality and commitments of the next president are absolutely the most important consideration for all of these reforms and re for restoring the dignity of the office. You know, the reality is it's only so much that can be done uh, with reforms before they become window dressing and do little good for the operation and effectiveness of the presidency. As Goldsmith suggests, preventing a reoccurrence of what happened during the last administration may have more to do with the person in the office than when any reform. Now turning now to a few of the recommendations from Baron Goldsmith with respect to congressional action, I was asked to focus on that. I agree that Congress should pass legislation requiring presidential nominees and presidents to disclose their tax returns annually under penalty of law. I also support barring the president from any role in oversight uh, in any business. I'm not 100% sold on the suggestion we eliminate the use of blind trust. I could make an argument for their continued use if either Congress or some ethics bodies has authority to monitor and report how the assets of the trust are affected by executive action. Two, and I support, in theory, I support the idea of criminalizing the granting of a pardon in exchange for bribes including clemency granted for silence or corrupt action in a legal proceeding. In theory, I also support Congress barring the president from obstructing justice by the protection of family members and interfering with elections. However, our founding fathers may have envisioned that the penalty for such conduct should be impeachment and removal from office and not criminal prosecution. Further imposing criminal liability is less of a deterrent if the president can issue a self-pardon. The Constitution, as we all know, only limits the president's pardon power to offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. 
As Bauer and Goldsmith acknowledge, there is no consensus whether Congress has the authority through legislation to further constrain the president and prohibit him from pardoning himself. However, I do agree that a congressional statute prohibiting self-pardons would likely be given some weight in the courts and perhaps might even be decisive. Three, I agree that Congress should upgrade legal protections against foreign election interference, including requiring campaigns to immediately report to the FBI any contact with foreign states offering campaign support or assistance. In my mind, this is a no-brainer. I don't understand what any, how anyone could have any issue with that. Number four, I agree the practice of President Trump temporarily placing allies in key Senate-confirmed positions following a vacancy is problematic. One solution offered is for Congress to significantly reduce the number of executive branch positions requiring confirmation. As someone who went to cap, to cap, up to Capitol Hill often to try to win support for President George W. Bush's executive branch and judicial nominees, I agree there are too many executive branch positions that require Senate confirmation. And I also believe that it takes far too long to get people confirmed. However, I doubt seriously the Senate will ever agree to reduce the current number of Senate confirmed positions. The senatorial prerogative is just simply too attractive. Ironically, this power has traditionally been considered as a check on executive branch abuses. If an executive branch agency refuses to provide information or otherwise cooperate, the Senate can encourage cooperation by holding up the confirmation of key leadership. Perhaps a better approach here might be to persuade Congress that hearings and confirmation votes for lower level positions would have to be completed so many days after nomination or the nominee is deemed confirmed. I do support amendments to the Federal Vacancies Reform Act to prohibit the temporary appointment of anyone to a cabinet level or deputy cabinet level position who does not already occupy an existing confirmed position within the same agency. Number five, other than Supreme Court appointments, no presidential act is more consequential than the decision to commit US troops in the use of force. Although the Constitution vests in the Congress the power to declare war, the nature of today's threats often require quick decision making uh, that's not likely possible, particularly in a politically divided Congress. Thus, in the past 50 years, we have seen more unilateral commitments of force by the president based on protecting US interests, including support for our allies. Congress, as we all know, attempted to limit presidential discretion by passing the War Powers Act some 50 years ago but it has proven largely ineffective and it's often ignored by the executive branch. Most recently, the White House has relied upon the president's commander in chief constitutional power, as well as congressional authorizations for legal authority to use force and to commit troops around the world. You know, I worked on the 2001 AUMF in response to the 9-11 attacks. I never imagined that our work 20 years ago would be cited as authority to commit troops around the world today. Now, no question the commitment of troops and resources demands greater congressional involvement. The president should always have to make the case to the American people through the Congress that using force is a last resort and is in our best interest. And I believe in these dangerous times, the president should have the authority and flexibility to respond to an immediate threat, followed immediately by full accounting to the American people through Congress. While I support the termination of the 2001 AUMF, we must monitor carefully the legal and security repercussions that follow. Most importantly, it's time for Congress to pass a new use of force statute that respects the constitutional powers of both the president and the Congress and that ensures protection of our liberty rights and our security interests. Concerns about White House influence, a number six of investigations and prosecutions at the Justice Department are very legitimate. Existing protocols limiting communications between the White House and the Justice Department should be observed and strengthened. Obviously, no senior level Justice Department official should be involved in any manner where they have a personal, political, or financial interest. Even the appearance of bias harms the credibility of the Justice Department. It's important that senior leadership know what's happening within the department. Knowledge does not mean influence. The Attorney General has responsibility to see that the work of the department is done without prejudice or bias, and that decisions of the dep of in department investigations and prosecutions are based on the merits and not carried out as a political vendetta. In conclusion, Bauer and Goldsmith offer several interesting ideas that I commend to Congress for its consideration. However, if we're serious about improving our system of government and protecting the rule of law, then perhaps we should start by looking in the mirror. To put it bluntly, we get the kind of leadership we vote for. And uh, let us hope that last November and in future elections, we secure the type of leadership this country and our children deserve and so desperately need 
individuals who possess a servant's heart and a demonstrated respect for the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. And let me take the opportunity to thank you and Professor Dickinson for your, for your incredible service to, to our country. And with that, uh, Professor Jeff Rosen, take it away. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be part of this distinguished panel. So the National Constitution Center, where I've been privileged to work uh, for the past couple of years, has an inspiring mandate uh, from the US Congress. And that is to increase awareness and understanding of the US Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. It has been a meaningful charge over the past four years to debate issues involving executive power in a nonpartisan way. Uh, and we've tried to meet the challenge by uh, insisting only on discussing constitutional issues, not political or policy issues regarding the presidency, and always by convening uh, scholars of different perspectives, uh, conservative, libertarian, and progressive, to explore areas of agreement and disagreement. So the big takeaway of the debates over the past couple of years about executive power has been, of course, that the expansion of executive power is not unique to President Trump, but has been a bipartisan phenomenon of the past uh, few decades, indeed of the post-war period. The numbers of executive orders concentrate the mind. So I'll just share them. So there were less than 10 executive orders in the first years of the Republic. It spiked to about 50 under President Lincoln, then went way down and then spiked again in the progressive era. It was about a thousand under Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. It went down again, bounced up to almost 4,000 under Franklin Roosevelt, and then settled into the 300 or so range for Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama. And then President Trump in one term issued 220, which was nearly as many as his predecessors had uh, in uh, two terms. And then President Biden beat FDR's record in his first uh, couple of weeks. Um, so uh, it's a bipartisan phenomenon and presidents have increasingly turned to executive orders to achieve uh, through fiat what they're unable to achieve in a polarized Congress. So what to do and what's a bipartisan way of approaching questions for reform. So the Constitution Center a year ago convened three teams of scholars, libertarian, progressive and conservative and asked them to uh, draft a constitution from, from scratch. In a state of nature, imagine that you were starting uh, from the beginning, what kind of constitution would you come up with? And the results surprised all of us. Far from abandoning the constitutional framework, all three teams proposed to reform or amend the constitution rather than to uh, uh, abandon it entirely. And even more surprisingly, there was striking agreement about the need to limit executive power. And remember, these three teams are operating literally behind a veil of ignorance. They're deliberating among themselves. The, the conservative team was, uh, was uh, led by Elon Werman, Robbie George, Michael McConnell, uh, and uh, others. The progressive team led by Carolyn Fredrickson of the, the American Constitution Society, the libertarian team by Ilya Shapiro of the Cato Institute. Here's what they came up with about executive power. Uh, they converged in the need to limit presidential power. Um, and in particular, they stressed the need to um, have structural reforms to check an increasingly imperial presidency. Uh, they, in particular, on uh, the election of the president, agreed on the need to have direct popular election of the president, of abandoning uh, the electoral college. Both the conservative and the libertarian teams uh, agreed on the need for direct popular election for the president. Uh, and all three teams clarified that the president's power to execute the law is not a freestanding power to make laws. The conservatives emphasized that executive orders shouldn't have legal effect unless authorized by Congress. The libertarians underscored that the power of the executive branch constitutes the power to execute the laws and not some broader freestanding power. And the progressives proposed that Congress's oversight authority over the executive branch must be made more explicit to ensure it can effectively police wrongdoing in program administration or otherwise. Uh, to increase Congress's oversight power over the president, both the conservative and the progressive constitutions would resurrect the legislative veto which the Supreme Court struck down in 1982, allowing Congress to repudiate presidential regulations 
and executive orders by majority vote. For both teams, the resurrection of the legislative veto would allow Congress to take the lead in lawmaking as the framers intended. Uh, along the same lines, all three constitutions would relax the standards for impeachment, making explicit that the president can be impeached for non-criminal offenses. At the same time, the conservative and progressive constitutions would require a three-fifths vote in the House to reduce the risk of partisan impeachment. The conservatives also noted it's generally improper for the president personally to direct prosecutions and that the president may not pardon himself or the vice president. Uh, the progressives included other reforms such as requiring a two thirds vote in the Senate for the confirmation of the attorney general to ensure that the law enforcement power of the federal government is not abused for partisan gain. The experiment was so successful and, and frankly so surprising that we're going to reconvene the teams this year and see if they can agree on specific language for a constitutional amendment. Uh, the conservative and progressive teams were pretty close when it came to the electoral college, uh, both provided that the president shall be elected by national popular vote uh, conducted using a ranked choice voting method. And we wanna see if all three teams could agree on a version like that. The libertarians chose not to include what they considered good government reform. So they uh, did not uh, include that uh, reform, but um, uh, we'll see. And uh, while agreeing that the electoral college system for choosing candidates isn't democratic enough, the conservatives thought the system for selecting candidates undervalued experience and character, they would abandon the presidential primary system, allowing candidates to be selected by elected representatives at the state level. They also resurrected a proposal that was nearly adopted at the original constitutional convention and would limit presidential terms to six years to encourage them to focus not on reelection, but on the common good. So this was quite striking. I've only described the executive power provisions of this uh, constitution drafting initiative. And I'll put in the chat the link to all three constitutions so you can check them out and learn from them because it was a uh, illuminating project. Um, more broadly, the Constitution Center for the past four years and longer has hosted a series of discussions about executive power and about all uh, contested constitutional issues on our uh, many media platforms focused on the interactive constitution. And for those of you who haven't uh, experienced this remarkable learning platform, I wanna describe it, put in a plug for it and ask you to uh, uh, check it out in particular its provisions on executive power. So we launched this in 2015. It's gotten 45 million hits since we launched and is now uh, the most Googled constitution in the world. Um, if you Google any particular provision, you're likely uh, for us to come up first. We were getting 500,000 hits a day during the uh, electoral college controversies, which broke all records. And what's so remarkable about this learning platform is that we've convened top uh, liberal and conservative scholars nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. And this remarkable model of thoughtful deliberation about uh, areas of agreement and disagreement is just a, a, a font of learning and light that has uh, uh, highlighted unexpected areas of agreement and disagreement. So I'll just choose one of the most uh, striking um, clauses involving executive power for the uh, habeas corpus uh, provisions uh, of the constitution. We convened then Professor Amy Coney Barrett and uh, uh, pro still Professor Neil Katyal to uh, produce a thousand words about what they agreed the suspension clause um, of Article 1, Section 9 meant. And then they had separate statements about what they disagreed about. And what they disagreed about was the correctness of Boumediene with uh, now Justice Barrett um, saying uh, clearly that uh, she believed that um, the dissenters who maintained that the suspension clause did not override Congress's choice to deny federal jurisdiction had the better of the argument, whereas Professor Katyal thought that Boumediene was correctly decided and discussed its application to more recent uh, cases before the DC circuit. So moving forward, uh, we're going to continue to convene uh, scholars uh, to explore reforms of the executive branch in particular and ways of resurrecting the guardrails of democracy more generally, the, the guardrails um, that have been eroded not only 
by uh, recent expansions of presidential power, but also by social media platforms, political polarization, and other framers that uh, the framers could not have anticipated. Um, so this is a call to action to all of you um, ALS friends. If you are interested in, in being involved in this initiative, uh, let me know, uh, jrosen at uh, law.gwu.edu, and we will um, explore ways of uh, hosting you for panels, podcasts, uh, town hall debates, and most importantly, and, and this is the real um, call to action, online classes on the Constitution for uh, middle, high school, and college kids. We launched live Constitution 101 classes when COVID hit, reached 200,000 kids live during the past year and are creating a web-based Constitution 101 classes, class for all levels, which will include an executive power unit, which will teach all of this wonderful material from a nonpartisan perspective. And we all know how urgently important it is to educate um, the next generation about the Constitution in general and executive power in particular. The framers thought that the American experiment would falter unless citizens were taught not only the substantive principles of the Constitution and its limits, uh, but also the habits of deliberation, how to disagree without being disagreeable and to explore our uh, constitutional disagreements productively. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do. And it would be wonderful to get all of you involved in that effort as well. Thanks so much and look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Jeff. And in the same spirit of thanks, thank you for your service you have in the country uh, in, in connection with your very important role uh, in the National Constitution Center. So uh, uh, before I call on Professor Peter Shane, we are going to have good time for, uh, for uh, discussion within the panel, but in particular for your questions. So I, I encourage and urge those of you on this, uh, on this, uh, uh, in this program to uh, post your questions in the chat. So let me call on our last uh, speaker, Professor uh, Peter Shane. Thanks, Dan. And uh, let me thank uh, the AALS for the invitation to be part of this panel. It is, as uh, Jeff said, a really, uh, really an honor to be uh, part of this group. And uh, of course, Dan, I appreciate the uh, kind invitation and the book plug. Um, in thinking about this panel, I've been, I started to wonder exactly, you know, could we be more specific as to what we mean by an improved presidency? What are we talking about? Um, judging from the kinds of insights that uh, Jack Goldsmith and Bob Bauer have in their book and the kinds of things we're talking about, it, it seems that you know, we probably have a consensus that, uh, that is among ourselves that we would like a presidency perhaps more reliably accountable to law and to institutional checks and balances. We would like presidents who are more respectful of democratic norms and the institutions that represent uh, what Jeff Rosen called the, the democratic guardrails. Um, this means in accepting the legitimacy of dissent. It means respecting, uh, as I've said, checks and balances, both among the branches and those checks that exist even within the executive branch, such as the existence of a, uh, of a professional civil service. It means respecting the Senate's appointment process. It means uh, respecting Congress's uh, oversight authority. We also want, I think, a presidency perhaps more reliably dedicated uh, than the last administration seemed to be to the interests of all Americans, not just their political base, and less likely to create the appearance or reality of abusing executive power. I think one way to summarize a lot of those aspirations is we would like a presidency that poses less of a risk of being authoritarian, even as it is effective in the proper discharge of executive power. We want a style of leadership that promotes genuine unity uh, across the citizenry, not a, a style of leadership that uh, polarizes the country. So if that's what we're talking about, then 2021 seems like a moment of both uh, promise, but uh, a reminder of limitations. Uh, on one hand, we have reason to suspect that the election of 2020 
uh, did reflect a strong feeling across a wide swath of Americans uh, that the prior administration had not behaved properly with regard to uh, the guardrails of democracy, with regard to the other branches of government, with regard to uh, Americans with whom uh, they disagreed or thought were uh, outside uh, the president's base. Um, and the sitting president, the person who took office in 2021, um, enjoyed a lot of the support that he received because of his articulation of uh, allegiance to those democratic norms and a kind of re-embrace of the fundamental principles of democracy. We also have a president now with uh, a uniquely deep legislative experience before taking the office of chief executive, which may give him greater sensitivity as to uh, the role of Congress and the ways in which the role of Congress uh, ought properly be honored. However, we have to remember, however, uh, we may be heartened by um, the, the rhetoric of the current president, his um, spoken uh, belief in democracy and the importance of demonstrating that democracy works, that unilateral reforms, things that the president can do by him or herself, are things that can also be reversed unilaterally. Permanent reforms, that is reforms that you know, are more deeply entrenched than uh, the signature of a president on uh, what may be a transient executive order, do require congressional enactment. And although, you know, what, uh, what Barron Goldsmith emphasized quite understandably, quite importantly, are a series of reforms within government, I believe, at least I want to venture the hypothesis that democratic reforms within government, if they are to be adopted by Congress, need to grow in a larger democratic context. That government you know, is unlikely to budge on enduring democratic reforms unless there is genuine constituent pressure to do so. And as a corollary, I want to suggest that constituent pressure to resist the more authoritarian possibilities of the executive branch requires public confidence in the capacity of a genuinely democratic government to deliver meaningful accomplishments and problem solving. And the problem that we have in our deeply polarized electorate is that for too many Americans, ideas like the rule of law, democracy seem just abstract. They are not part of their lived civic experience. So, you know, we, we on this panel, uh, you know, have the privilege of uh, occupying positions of uh, influence in relatively elite institutions. Um, we feel our interests are probably pretty well represented and that we have rather genuine opportunities to exert influence over public policy. But for broad swaths of the American populace, that's just not their experience. Their experience is not the people who are in power are accountable to me or feel themselves accountable to me. And so I think in the long run, an improved democracy rep respecting presidency really needs an improved American democracy. The idea of democracy just has to be more deeply a part of the lived experience of more people. So in the, in the book that Dan was kind enough to plug for me, um, I've suggested that if we, <laughs> um, and, and maybe this reflects the fact that, you know, we have a bunch of current and, and past deans on, uh, on the program. Uh, I, th I think about a strategic plan and um, strategic plans, you know, have, you know, they have goals and strategies. And I, and I always try to remember <laughs> which is which. Um, but I believe that four goals that we could talk about in terms of uh, reinforcing democracy Number one would be the goal of reducing barriers to democratic participation in existing institutions. Number two would be shoring up those institutions on which the citizens of the United States rely for relevant, credible information about public affairs, not just nationally, but locally. We need to strengthen 
the capacity of Americans to engage with information in a, an increasingly complex uh, information ecology. We have to generate opportunities and motivation for meaningful public engagement. And I think we have to enable less wealthy and other underrepresented groups to build organizations that can offer some countervailing balance against the political power of the wealthy who, who probably are already experiencing uh, democracy as being real for them. So what would be some strategies? And here I'm just going to, you know, I'll be very, I'll be rather general and of course would be happy to discuss any of these ideas at greater length. But in terms of uh, making it easier to participate in existing institutions, of course, I'm interested in reforms that make voting easier and ballot counting more secure. In terms of shoring up the institutions on which citizens rely for uh, relevant, credible information about public affairs, I think we need to strengthen institutions beyond commercially driven private markets to support news reporting, especially at the state and local level. And notice that I use the word reporting, not the word journalism. We have, we have a flood, a flood tide of information in journalism, but reporting is unique. Reporting the search for relevant, credible facts about how those in power are exercising that power that is, um, that, that we do not have, that's in danger. Third thing we need to do, if we wanna strengthen the capacity of citizens to engage with information, we really need to redouble our dedication to public education and public libraries. We need to, um, uh, and you know, I, I am among those who believes that the, the, the so-called failures of public education are often exaggerated. The failures are really the failures of um, poor, impoverished, low-income school districts to offer their students the kinds of opportunities that exist in so many others. If we want to generate opportunities for and motivation for meaningful uh, civic engagement, then we should provide uh, local projects that allow representative groups of citizens to yield binding outcomes. Um, there are lots of models for this. A problem uh, with creating these projects uh, in a really large volume is that although local government is probably where the action is in terms of making people feel engaged with democracy, they typically don't have the resources to do the kind of uh, local deliberation, broad scale deliberation uh, that I have in mind. And so Congress could usefully create a federal fund to support state and local projects that allow uh, engaged citizens in representative groups to deliberate on, on at least some significant fraction of key issues. And in terms of uh, allow, enabling less wealthy and other underrepresented groups to, to experience more of a level playing field when it comes to public policy, our, I think our legal frameworks need to be more supportive of unions and other forms of social and political organizations that can help to level the playing field uh, for influence over public policy. The enemy of democracy, the enemy of genuine democracy really is polarization. Studies show that you know, the way in which would-be authoritarian leaders uh, start down the road of deconstructing genuine democracy is by exploiting the distrust and the, um, and again, the existing polarization among voters. I think that if we want a people who are united in their determination to preserve democratic norms, to elect presidents respectful of those norms, then we need a citizenry that is united in their experience that democratic governance based on mutual respect and equal concern is as productive for them as would be an authoritarian alternative. That's what will lead them to vote for pro-democracy presidential candidates. This is not a silver bullet. This is not something that can be done quickly, but I take heart from a line from um, the political theorist and law professor, Danielle Allen, 
who wrote uh, an article, a wonderful article in the Atlantic called The Road from Serfdom. She said, small increments of change multiplied by decades are what put us where we are. They can also pull us out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter, and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, I encourage you to put some questions in the chat. We're already starting to get some. And let me take the prerogative of moderator and and, uh, and, and and push all of you, anyone who wants to take this with, with, a, with a, at least a mild uh, provocation. And, and, and what I'd say is this, the panel is about, about improving the presidency, not uh, about restraining the presidency. Nonetheless, most of the comments, uh, the presentations, all, all again from fascinating and different perspectives uh, speak, seem to speak in some detail and, and particularly in, in Professor Shane's presentation at some useful level of generality about abuse of power, about how to restrain and, and curtail various abuses, whether it be executive order, uh, orders, uh, whistleblowers, uh, 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 quite a long list. I want to try to capture, push the panelists on some suggestions uh, about improving the performance of presidents. And, and I well understand that those two were not uh, restricting the, and restraining the presidency is not hermetically sealed from creating the conditions under which the, the president can help improve democracy, improve the performance of, of institutions, enhance the economy, uh, make good appointments, and, and all of that. But I wonder if, if any of you would, uh, or all of you, would reflect a little bit on some, uh, some reforms that could be adopted that would really be geared at less about uh, curtailing abuses of authority and more about directing the president, the, the president and the presidency and the executive branch toward improving the performance. And maybe you want to say a bit about what, what, what that might mean, uh, improving the performance of the executive branch and the president from a, maybe, from a, maybe a, from a more positive uh, perspective. Or, or maybe interrogate the question, suggest that there isn't much of a distinction at all between restraint, restraint and, uh, and improvement. And anybody, can, anybody? Yeah, I'll please. Take, I'll Judge. take a shot at uh, at least beginning the discussion. I think it's at several levels that, that you improve the performance of the president. Um, at one level, basic level, Andy Carr, President Bush's first chief of staff, he used to tell me his number one responsibility was the care and feeding of the president to make sure the president um, gets plenty of exercise, eats well, and gets plenty of sleep because the demands of the job are incredibly difficult. And so you want to improve his performance by making sure that the president is well rested and well taken care of. Uh, and, and thinking about your question, it occurred to me that um, I don't know, we, obviously President George W. Bush had the benefit of witnessing his dad, close, his dad in the White House close up. But if you don't have that kind of experience, uh, you know, you may not have a historical context about uh, common problems that, that presidents run into, that chief executives run into. I'm not suggesting a, a history lesson or a presidential power class for, for the incoming president, but it probably is true that, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling given the performance and the statements by President Trump, he had really no idea the responsibilities and, and the history of the office. And it may be that that something like that, it, you know, may, may make sense. I don't know if you, you can't require it, but that I think could be, that could be important in improving the performance of the president, just having a better understanding of the history of the office, uh, issues and problems confronted by previous presidents, it, it, stuff like that. Take myself on mute. I, I could uh, insert in a sarcastic comment about golf at this at this uh, uh, juncture, but will not <laughs> restrain myself. And uh, and Peter, you 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 wanted to jump in on this. Sure. You know your, your question, Dan, which is a very good one. Um, I think also ought to remind us that although we're talking about improving the presidency or the or the, or the we're speaking of the presidency as if it is just a person, and although. President Trump seems to find this hard to understand. The presidency is really a, a, a we, it's not an I. Um, the White House is not a single individual. And if by um, making the president yet more effective, what we, what we mean is creating the capacity for the executive branch to deliver on 
the execution of the laws in an effective way, making recommendations that are, you know, solid recommendations for new legislation, the kinds of things we would want the executive branch to do, then it seems to me that one way of improving the presidency is strengthening the capacity, not just of the presidential office, but of the agencies within the executive branch. So, for example, and you know, President Biden has sort of taken this on. Um, and, and let me say, I, I am the, just so you know that there's a personal angle here, I, I was subject to a tax audit that yielded an error of, I believe, $3.57. Meanwhile, meanwhile, there are, you know, corporations and um, high income individuals who are not being audited simply because the IRS doesn't have the staff and the capacity to do it. We could, and I'm sure examples like this could be multiplied across a great many agencies. If we want agencies to perform better, we ought to give them the resources necessary to expect good performance. We got some questions coming in fast and furiously in the can chat, just, which I'm happy to but Can I jump in fast? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Anybody yeah. else want to jump in on this question? Jeff, please. Be great. Um, so just yesterday, I interviewed Akhil Amar about his pathbreaking new book, The Words That Made Us, and just want to recommend it as enthusiastically as possible. And this uh, book, which by turning to the primary text that the founders relied on, uh, resurrects the major constitutional debates from 1760 to 1840 in a, in a just a, a exciting and clarifying way. So on executive power, he emphasizes that Washington was far more influential than Madison at the convention. It was Washington's emphasis on unity above all and on creating a government powerful enough to achieve common purposes and provide for the common defense that animated the convention, not Madison's emphasis on protecting freedom of conscience and individual rights from state as well as federal uh, tyranny and mobs. So Akhil really parses Washington's farewell address and the two big themes that are come through there are the importance of uh, the president emphasizing unity and devotion to the common good as well as cultivating virtue in the people. And of course, virtue seems antique, but Washington said that the Republic would collapse without it. It's substantially true that virtue of morality is a necessary spring of popular government. Um, and Washington thought that could be promoted by the institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge, uh, and in particular, a national university that would instruct citizens in the science of government. So the Constitution Center is aspiring to answer Washington's call by serving as that, uh, a nat that national university. And in our next incarnation, we will launch on our website a founder's library of primary texts uh, from the founding to the second founding to the civil rights era, as well as classes on these principles. But um, of course, the whole notion sounds so antique today. How could we reform the current presidency so that presidents can emphasize national virtue uh, and unity. And uh, I, uh, although the task is very difficult, uh, structural reforms that insulate presidents from the factionalizing pressures of social media and political polarization are crucial. Uh, it's a totally nonpartisan statement to say that the idea of tweeting presidents would have appalled uh, the framers because Madison says there should be no direct communication between the president and uh, constituents at all. Uh, there's supposed to be the mediating influence of thoughtful representatives who are gonna ensure the slow diffusion of knowledge across the Republic um, as expressed by enlightened journalists who he called a literati who were supposed to help people read the Federalist Papers thoughtfully and uh, debate. Even I'm smiling of course, as I uh, uh, talk about this. And one thing that emerged in the discussion with Akhil yesterday that I literally brought tears to my eyes is was his confession that not only do our least advantaged students not take time to read documents like the Federalist Papers today, but even his own students at, at Yale, he said, uh, are less uh, inclined to the habits of deep reading than, um, than uh, they used to be. So the, the challenge is deep and it's not just the presidency. The presidency is a reflection of the polarization and um, uh, shallowification of public 
discourse, but to the degree that we can protect presence, that would be good. And that's why some of those uh, reforms um, proposed by our teams, including six-year presidential terms without the possibility of re-election, maybe no presidential primaries, um, and other uh, things that uh, prevent presidents from being uh, the, uh, uh, susceptible to the uh, polarizing pressures of the day are worth thinking about. That may have as much to do with uh, changes to Facebook and uh Twitter and the algorithms that they use that are so polarizing uh, that it has to do with constitutional reform. Great, thank you very much. Professor Dickinson, do you wanna get in on this before? Yes, uh, just really quickly, uh, yeah. uh, just um, I wanted to build on something that, that Peter said in response to your question, which I, I think it's important to note that the presidency is not one person, but it's a large we. And I think that there are reforms that could help uh, the president do a better job by um, making that uh, we uh, work better. Um, uh, specifically, um, you know, it's been discussed earlier today, reducing the number of Senate confirmed positions could help uh, get a president's team in and uh, running uh, sooner in an administration, and that could be great. I also think uh, diversity in appointments is, is really important. Uh, research shows that diverse teams are better teams, and I think this administration has made that a big priority, and I think that is really important for the president uh, to do a, uh, a good a job. I'm part of a, an organization. I'm on the board of the Leadership Council for Women in National Security, which promotes uh, diversity in national security appointments. And I think, you know, that helps the president, um, you know, represent uh, uh, people and do a good job. Uh, uh, and so that's very important. And then finally, what I would just say uh, about the role, I, I think the role of lawyers is actually quite important. And I think that the recommendation from uh, Jack and, and Bob to depoliticize uh, uh, some of the White House counsel's uh, role by moving lawyers into OLC, I think is an interesting one. I also think institutionalizing the role of the lawyers group uh, uh, would be uh, very important. And I think that 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 things to shore up uh, the role of uh, key lawyers within uh, presidential administrations uh, could also help. So thank you for that. Let me let me get to the questions. And this is let me uh, uh, immediately turn to a question that uh, I'm going to mention the folks names unless they ask me not to. The Judy Arene, our executive director of LLS asked, because it's, it really segues exactly from what you just said, Laura, which is who in the executive branch should have the responsibility of improving democracy and the rule of law. And she mentions the White House Counsel, Attorney General, Office of Legal Counsel. Judge Gonzalez, I'm going to take the liberty of asking you, you you've had almost all of those positions. So, so uh, uh, maybe start off and anybody who wants to we, wants step I, in. Dan, I think we all do. Uh, I began my remarks by talking about the fact that I felt it's, it's the duty of government officials, those, those particularly who take an oath, it's the duty of lawyers, it's the duty of scholars. Uh, I, I think it's our collective responsibility to promote, to protect the rule of law. Right, thank you. Any, any, uh, anyone else, that, that, that's a hard act to follow in more ways than one, <laughs> but uh, any, anybody? Uh... Well, I think um, you know, what uh, Judge Gonzalez just said is absolutely right, but at the same time, you know, I went to law school when it was everybody's job to teach, teach us to be ethical lawyers, um, but it was not a required course. And um, that was probably in some ways not the most effective form of training. And so I think, you know, Judy's, uh, I think behind Judy's question is the insight that unless someone's portfolio, unless someone is accountable for, you know, how they are graded as a government official depends on whether democracy is stronger or not, um, that, that something that is everybody's job can easily become no one's job. I do think having some kind of, um, I don't know whether the office, the office perhaps might usefully be in the Department of Justice. Um, it should be, I think, at arm's length in the White House, but again, you wanted to have White House support. Uh, you want an office that will focus on the creating the kinds of opportunities uh, for ordinary citizens to engage in democratic deliberation that is meaningful, that will help bridge the kinds of gulfs that we've been talking about. 
you know, I, I can't help but attach this question and particularly Judge Gonzalez's comment about all of our responsibility to one of the last things that Jeff Rosen said about in, in invoking a keel and, and, and the notion that our students may be less uh, uh, agile at or committed to the kind of, I think as he put it, close reading of, of not only founding texts, but maybe some of the issues uh, issues that, that arise that give us the capacity and our students the capacity as future lawyers to do the kind of responsibility and carry out those responsibilities. Let me get to a question that Professor Jeremy Paul asked, and he posted in the chat to all of us, and I'll just read it. Professor Rosen stressed the need for nonpartisan approaches and also noted that all three of his panels advocate a direct election of presidents, but in the current configuration, a shift to direct election will help Democrats. What equivalent useful idea might be paired with a shift to popular vote to attract GOP support. Jeff, you want to <laughs> you want to tackle that first? Remember that the uh, proposal for the national popular vote came from the conservative team. They're, they're certainly not friends of Democrats. They, although they're no doubt, of course, were only divided, uh, devoted to the pure shining light of principle without any partisan considerations whatsoever. I think they still thought that they'd have a shot with a national uh, popular vote for GOP presidents. They they, they paired it with uh, better candidates, more uh, Washingtons and, and fewer um, uh, uh, the, the populist candidates by taking out the primary system and allowing filtration of candidates. So, um, but uh, the, the real, it, it, it ties into the next uh, question that Ned Foley asks, which I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try to uh, introduce. Please, you. yeah, no, please. Great to, and great to um, see you, Ned. And Ned has done the most amazing uh, podcasts and panels for us and for so many platforms about the election. So thanks for all your light. Ned asks, uh, what would a populist constitution look like given the fact that 35 to 40 percent of the American electorate identify themselves with Trump style populism? I suppose it, um, it would uh, get rid of the Senate. And the most surprising thing about the Constitution Project was that the progressives kept the Senate, uh, although they emphasize the value of democracy and equality rather than liberty for the libertarians and deliberation for the conservatives. They still thought that representing the states as states was important enough that uh, the Senate should be kept, although tweaked. So uh, a, 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 cop, a populist constitution would be plebiscitary in every level and would have a popular house, maybe a unicameral house or whatever, uh, a, a popular elected Senate and house and popular president and um, I don't know, maybe the ability to overturn judicial decisions by popular vote as Theodore Roosevelt proposed and now as the new Judicial Reform Commission uh, that uh, Bob Bauer and Christina Rodriguez are uh, looking at will we'll consider proposals that include uh, that kind of court curbing legislation. So all this is to say, I think Ned's question combined with uh, Jeremy's reminds us that the, the balance between populism and republicanism may be as important as which side favors the Democrats or Republicans and uh, striking that uh, we, we had no populists among our libertarians, conservatives and uh, progressives. Can I ask a, a, a cynical question as a follow up, Jeff? And that is, as a factual matter, was this convening? Did it happen after the election, which is to say after the turnover, Democratic control of the Senate or before? And does that you know, it, it, play yeah. Anywhere? Fine to be cynical and delighted to give the earnest, uh, idealistic response. It was, it was, you know, half year before this was. This was, it was totally surprising. It was, it was in the uh, last year of the Trump presidency. Three teams, and they just blew everyone away with with their proposals. Great. Anyone else on this? So, no, please, please. Jeff. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have anything else on this. I guess I wanted to go back to the previous question, just sitting here thinking about. Please where do. I might put someone responsible for ensuring uh, the growth of the, or protection of the rule of law, I would probably look at two places, one within the office of the attorney general itself, the other within OMB, because uh, as I recall, hmm. uh, in the White House, OMB would uh, grade every agency on various metrics, performance metrics, and that would be one thing. And and obviously, since they control the purse, spring, the purse strings for uh, all the departments and cabinet agencies, there would be a great deal of uh, motivation for them to make progress in, on this issue. Interesting. Thank you. You know, well, I someone, wanna, oh, please. Oh, no, 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 please. No, 
I, so I also agree. I think having a focal point for um, rule of law could be helpful. Um, I do think you the, the downside would be replicating bureaucracy um, or if you create a focal point, say within the White House, it's going to be like herding cats for that person. But uh, at least that person um, is somebody who's going to answer to that issue and go up to Congress, testify. So I, I think it's an interesting uh uh, interesting idea. Just on um, structural democracy reform, I'll just say very briefly, I think we need filibuster uh, reform. More specifically? Well, yeah, I mean, I think to counterbalance uh, the sort of gridlock that we have in Congress and uh, the sort of real obstacles to uh, presidents getting their agendas through, um, I also think the modern form of the filibuster is not necessarily what it has been historically. Um, and so I think that that could be a way to address uh, at least a small piece uh, of this of this issue that uh, Jeremy's raised. Right. I was, Peter, please. Yeah, one other sort of institutional suggestion. Going back to um, my thought that Congress could usefully direct that certain uh, certain federal law just be devoted to funding state and local projects to build democracy at the local level. It might be helpful if we had uh, something like a National Institute for Democracy that would be in charge of funding such projects and that kind of organization standing outside uh, the usual cabinet agencies might be able to do the kind of grading uh, exercise that uh, Judge Gonzalez mentioned, which could be a useful thing to do. Right. We, we, we haven't addressed much in this panel. I know it's come up in other contexts, uh, the role of the courts. And there's a narrative, of course, about President Trump uh, uh, being uh, actively engaged in, in weaponizing the courts. And maybe, uh, again, this is a narrative. I'm introducing, as we say, not for the truth of the matter asserted, but weaponizing the courts and delegating a lot of the responsibility and prerogatives to the federal society and other to, uh, you know, to, to stack the courts. Uh, not to mention the 11th hour appointment of of, uh, of Judge Justice uh, Barrett and the issues that that raises. So, any anything about uh, uh, reforming or improving the presidency that bears on uh, on uh, on some solution, structural solutions to uh, to what we do about the judiciary, focusing on the president, not not so much about the expanding the size of the court and other other kinds of reforms. I think it's hard to think about focusing on the president without thinking about what the president's incentives are with regard to the court. And I do think, again, if, if our overall aim is to have presidents who are more pro-democracy, less willing to try to manipulate the courts, and particularly, it would be helpful to kind of reduce the incentive that now exists given the system of you know, life tenure on the Supreme Court specifically to appoint perhaps young people who uh, the president, who a president believes, you know, identifies with his or her, you know, particular profile of public policy beliefs. Um, ideas have circulated for, you know, for, you know, Article Three appointments are for life. They don't necessarily have to be for life to exactly one court. Um, maybe someone's service would be limited on the Supreme Court to ten or fifteen years. I mean, uh, Justice Souter kind of did this to himself, but went on with a judicial career that still con continues, I believe. Um, just reducing the opportunities that the president has to uh, to put too much power in the hands of co-partisans on the court, you know, might be useful. Great. Anyone and else winding down, please, Jeff? Yes. Just very quickly, we'll note that the one other proposal that the conservative and progressive teams converged around, in addition to the national popular vote, was 18-year term limits for Supreme Court justices. Another surprise, and this was last year, and they both agreed on it. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yes. My view is a matter whether it's 15. 10, whatever, it's going to be, it, it will be politicized. Uh, I, I don't think you escape the politicization regarding appointments to the court, confirmation battles, what, whatever the length of term, because that is the last word and the stakes are so high. And so I, I, I'm not sure how much that's going to help us, but you know, we'll, I think this is worthy of a very strong and uh, debate because uh, it's an important issue. I would just say just for term limits, I think one of the issues is, you know, how do you limit um, 
uh, judges going into private practice and what incentives that could set. Justice Breyer has spoken about that. But I think one way you get around that if you want to have term limits is to do this plan that Peter mentioned where, you know, the the judge, the justices will just go back to being other federal judges as opposed to staying on the court. Thank you. Well, that uh, you ended at exactly the right uh, uh, moment and we'll give you the last word on that. I want to take the opportunity to once again, thank uh, ALS and, and, and its partners for, for putting together this, this wonderful program and thank all the panelists for, uh, for your contributions and your, your participation. So thank you for that. Uh, I do have my, as my last duty as moderator, the, 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 uh, the privilege and the honor of, as a matter of segue of introducing, uh, my good friend, colleague, partner in, in, in crimes. I put those in air quotes and that's, uh, uh, Darby Dickerson, uh, who is the immediate past president of ALS is the Dean of the John Marshall at University of Illinois Chicago School of Law and is the Dean designate of Southwestern Law School in uh, Los Angeles, who is going to uh, give us some, some final, uh, final remarks. So without further ado, let me uh, turn, uh, turn the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the duties over to uh, uh, Dean Dickerson. Thank you, Dan. What a fantastic first day this has been. I want to thank all of the moderators and speakers who joined us today with a particular shout out to Bob Bauer and Gold, Jack Goldsmith, whose book inspired the conference. I wanna thank ABA President Patricia Lee Rifo for having the ABA serve as a co-host of this conference. Thanks to Kelly Testy, president of LSAC for providing all of the technology support. Thanks to my fellow AALS officers, Vincent Rougeau and Erwin Chemerinsky for their work on the conference committee. A big shout out to the staff of AALS and the staff of LACC. They have done such tremendous work planning for the conference and they have been great throughout the day. And to everyone who joined us today, thank you. We really appreciated your participation and engagement. We did issue a call for papers related to the conference topics, and we did receive some in response. I want to thank the professors who submitted and the professors who've agreed to review those papers. We hope that today's uh, conference and tomorrow's conference and this call will inspire more members of the academy and legal profession to write more on these important matters in the months to come. Please join us tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time for the second day of the conference, which will address voting rights, race, and elections. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you.